Good evening, everybody. All right. So, my name is Marcel, and I'm here to talk to you about my new book, The Bright Report. Hopefully, it'll give you some idea what it's about, and maybe if you're interested or not. All right. So. It is a collection of six themed short stories, each with some humor angle of some kind, um, in the tradition of something like the Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. Um, instead of a bunch of English fuddy-duddies going around the English countryside and failing at things, I have a bunch of very self-important journalists covering a wide range of human experience and finding some rather strange things. All right. So, um, in this first volume of the Bright Report, because there are more coming, um, we have six sto short stories, one covering art, in which a strange new word has taken over the graphic design world and nobody knows quite what it means. Then there is a sport story detailing the sixth annual giant Patagonian snail race. Um, yes. Um, there is a travel story in which our intrepid explorer goes into the cloud islands to view a very strange and technologically advanced tribe. Then we have a motoring um, piece, kind of in a sort of a, a Top Gear type flavor, but with a bit of a twist in reviewing the Lave Series D. Then we also have a bit of a twisty, <laughs> yeah, for snails, yes, uh, a bit of a twisty board game review in which a board game where you have to become a literary great through absolutely convoluted means, dice rolls, and card pools. But the story I'm going to read for you tonight comes from the literature desk of Monsieur Jacques Bord, the Bright Report's foremost literary critic, and also the source of most of the complaints that the Bright Report see, receives from the general public. So in the story, Monsieur Bord is sent to the island of Chiprock to uncover a mysterious author who wrote one book and disappeared. So if you're all ready, I'm going to read you a little story. And then afterwards, you can ask me questions if you want. And then hopefully we'll still have power. All right. Okay. So, The Chiprock Recluse by Jacques Borg. The storm was horrible. I, I should describe it better. Illustrate the tempest we found ourselves in with all my literary prowess. I could mention the rocking of the boat, the thunderous thunder, the blinding lightning, and the shouting of the men running across the deck. Perhaps I could cast away the cliches and attempt something original. Um, my eggs, Benedict, was making its presence known in the back of my throat. My mind was treading water, and my guts were gurgling. No. The storm was horrible, sums it up. I, Jacques Bord, literary critic extraordinaire and senior writer for The Bright Report, hate islands as much as I hate clichés. Water on all sides, and no escape from the locals. 
But here I am, I'm making the crossing to Chiprock Island in a tub clicking with empty whiskey bottles. Oh, Mr. Balding, in his infinite wisdom, has thought it good and sound to send me to this little slice of nowhere. He sent me here to sniff out a cliché of all things, a reclusive writer. How did I get here, you ask? What did I do to deserve this? I would like to believe that the Bright Report is chasing trends. There, I said it. Edit it out, if you dare. As I am the only bibliophilic hack the report has, I was sent, down, sent to track down a sensational new voice in the world of genre fiction. This certainly was not my, was not some kind of cold revenge for my less than favorable review of our editor's niece's so-called modern takes on the Bronte works. Certainly not. The man agreed with me, though. I digress. Before I was subjected to the salt water hell referred to locally as a paddle across the pond, the world was taken by storm by a modest collection of short stories. A saccharine anthology of slice of life meets H.P. Lovecraft fishmen. Light-hearted fantasy, some might call it, not my usual grazing grounds as a critic as, reg as my regular readers will know. But say one thing of Jack Board, say that he has an open mind. Open enough. I enjoyed the eight stories in The Aquatic Acquaintance well enough. The author, one Shemina Film, achieved an unlikely sense of believability in his slash her mer in his slash her merging of the mundane and the unreal. He or she convinced enough readers of this brilliance to achieve bestseller status in several countries. The world was hungry to know who Shemaya Fim was. Perhaps it was a pen name, or the initials of several authors, something tedious like that. There are no clues. Even the publishers of the collection were at a loss. You have a go. That is S A S H A M I N A F I M. You figure it out. I got stuck on the first four letters and I stopped bothering with it. Adding to the mystery is the fact that there uh, is no author bio and no real geographic information other than the quaint island setting described in each of the stories. There was the occasional mention of Svalbard. Kyrgyzstan, and the Hebridean island of Staffa, but nothing concrete on the setting itself. Miss Feem from the linguistics desk assured me that she detected a slight Rhode Island accent to the dialogue, something which she insists the author is trying to cover up. If they asked me, and they did not, the characters' accents read like cartoon pirates. Nevertheless, my mind was at ease. We would never track this film person down. Mr. Balding would never send me on such an assignment, and I could stick to real literature. Prose that really said something. That would have been easy, but as you know, things are never easy for the protagonist. Enter my colleague, Mr. Carmichael Carmichael, travel journalist extraordinaire. He is the kind of man who drinks tea with his pinky at an exact angle one moment and then spear fishes with the tribes of Papua New Guinea the next. The sort of man who knows the names of all the Himalayan peaks, not just the tallest one and not just what arrogant Europeans call them either. The sort of man who travels everywhere. 
He needed only a few paragraphs to solve the mystery. That's old Chiprock, dear boy, he told me. Capital place. It's a real, how do I put it, storybook place. Yes. Try the trout special. The man was quite impressed with his achievement. I really must thank him after I extract myself from the jaws of Poseidon. But the time for creative retribution would come later. That brings me back to my ordeal by boat. The storm raged on. I asked our captain, a grizzled man lost in the woods of his mid-forties, whose wobbly gait I should have seen as a measure of his sobriety, why we could not wait for the weather to clear. He assured me that he had seen worse. I gazed into the jagged black water that surrounded and occasionally spilled into our little tug. The milky eye of a pale cetacean peering at us from the surf was the only thing that seemed as if it could match the description of worse. But we went on. The crew shouted. The wind howled. My ex-Benedict made a break for it. I ruined my best jacket that day. All for some recluse. Alas, Neptune did not take me into his embrace. Half drowned and carrying a pint of ocean in my Oxford, we emerged on the shore of Chiprock Island. The dock, if you can call the rotten plank collection that, did little to display the island's virtues. They were only rocky cliffs and rocky shores. A muddy track was the only path into the village. Several disillusioned crew members and I flopped ourselves onto the moldy pier like the day's catch. Insults flew. I bid them thanks in my own special way, but they did not seem to appreciate my outstretched finger. Look at the boat, Mr. Fouchon, the commander of our doomed dinghy, ordered with an accusational cone, uh, tone. It ain't gonna fix itself. How long, I ventured. I could not see the opposite shore anymore, just purple darkness. The wind whipped around the man, his white beard flapping. He looked as mad as Ahab. I shouldn't be more than a day or so. That be if the lads work hard and the wee drizzle clears. I originally attended, uh, intended to spend no more than a few hours on Chip Rock. For one, I did not bring any luggage. I was tempted to repeat my hand gesture. Fortunately, thank you, uh, fortunately a fight broke out amongst the deckhands regarding wages and or the virtues of someone's mother and or girlfriend. I left them to the colloquial dealings and limped my way into town. The storm had calmed a little as I ascended the muddy track. Patches of sky were mockingly clear. Soon the muddy trail became a cobbled main road. Crooked stone buildings emerged from the fog. Rural folk appeared. Perhaps it was the beret that made them stare. Certainly, there was no one dressed like I was in sight. More likely, it was the fact that I was leaking like a holy bucket. I ignored their looks of suspicion and surprise and tried to light a cigarette. My, na my matches were damp. Everything was waterlogged. If only we set off a few minutes later, I would have been spared the indignation. I would have had my customary broody smoke upon arrival. That was usually the best first impression to make of this dripping mess. If only we set off, I'm uh, sorry, um, I found a spot beneath a roof overhang. The bulky metal structure looked like a warehouse of some kind. It smelled of fish and was decorated with a network of rust. The stranger had out, held out a lighter. The warmth of its little flame nourished my soul. 
said stranger appeared with the suddenness of lightning. She was a woman. Maybe in her late fifties, her hair, strands of grey and dull blonde, were ratcheted back into a tight ponytail. The skin of her face was sun-wrinkled, and her hands were rough. She wordlessly lit her own cigarette. A quiet moment of dripping followed. Swim here? She asked without looking. Close enough, I said. We stood beneath the overhang and watched the lightning stutter in the distance. You the reporter, she said. It did not feel like a question. I nodded as I wrung out my beret. There was a bath worth of water in it. I was also becoming increasingly, increasingly aware that my notebook and dictaphone were weighing down my inside jacket pocket. Supposed to be, I said. You'll be wanting to stay at the paddle and all then, she said. She took a deep drag of a cigarette and expelled it in a long sigh. She watched the drops from the roof edge dive through the smoke cloud. She looked at me for the first time. Her grey eyes shone with the light of the storm. Don't try the trout special, she said amid a chorus of thunder. I assured her that I would not. She took advantage of the pause in the deluge and stomped off towards the docks. Any attempt to ascertain her identity or her business was flatly ignored. Once I finished my cigarette, I squelched my way up Chiprock's main road. Most of the village's quaint little houses were built along its endless, uh, relentless incline. The cobbles glittered, much like they did in the author's stories. As I progressed, there was the occasional squeal of a rusty window being opened with the laughter of children running to post-storm freedom. Every inhabitant, including the jubilant youths, regarded my waterlogged state with quiet amusement. My soggy hellos went un unanswered. Then I found it. Moss-covered stone made up the structure of the paddle and oar. Dark green window frames gave a view to a dark interior, like the hovel of some fairy tale hermit. The oily patrons fell silent as I stepped in. The sound of dripping accompanied each squelching footstep. I beached myself upon a corner seat and felt the weight of my fatigue. A great thirst was within my salty bones as the tide of, of seawater receded from me. Sherry, I wheezed at the serving girl. To describe the look she gave me as funny would not entirely do it justice. The patrons soon turned to my strange, uh, soon tired of my strangeness and went upon, upon, about their mundane chitter chatter. They were certainly strange to me. Now that I come to think of it, they were hunched and dirty. The exact, the exact nature of their dirt was hard to define. Each patron seemed to be worn down somehow. Like the barnacle, barnacled belly of an old trawler. I hate islands. I distrust island people. A cruel thing struck me. This could be a leper colony. A grubby bookshelf leant against the wall next to the fireplace. It was packed with waterlogged magazines and chubby dictionaries. To my surprise, several pristine copies of the aquatic acquaintance were in attendance. Damn my luck. This was the right place. The waitress placed, a, placed the glass of ambrosia down and gave me a searching look. She too seemed tide-worn at a coastal cliff, all crow's nests and jagged edges. Her eyes, like dull pearls, settled on my shoes. 
Evidently, a puddle was forming. Better take them off, she foghorned. Toes will get the rot. Then you got loads of trouble. Lepers stared. I could feel them. I thanked her softly, hoping that my hoping to lower her volume. We have some socks, she said. Her voice bounced off the walls. Her voice was giving me tinnitus. Um, thank you, I managed. And um, perhaps, if not too inconvenient, a, ro a clean room. Right you are, she boomed. That'll be the royal suite. Only one we got going. I cringed. Even the people in the street were privy to the conversation. Yes, thank you, he said. I hoped that I could lead by example by speaking softly. I would like to book it. How long will you be, then? Here for business or pleasure? I assured her that I would only be here for a night and that it certainly was not for pleasure. The establishment was silent as if every drinker had been listening. I stopped the waitress from wandering off. Um, perhaps you can help me, I said, leaning close. Speak up, love. My low voice persisted. Uh, I am looking for Shamina Fim. Do you know where I could find him or her? Shamina Fim, you say? She said audibly. Several wooden chairs creaked. A number of beer mugs were put down. Um, yes, I said, pointing to the bookcase. Um, the author of that book, Shamaya Fim, does this person live on the island somewhere? Have you met them? The waitress scratched her chin and chewed her lip. Can't say I have, love. What'd you say your business was again? Uh, I didn't say, I said. The atmosphere was thick and threatening, as if I announced my undying support of a rival football club. I must have the wrong place then, I ventured. I'll be off in the morning, um, with the tide, as they say. The woman seemed satisfied with this and left me to my sherry. Conversation returned to the paddle and oar like a phantom wave. I began removing my shoes, wondering if the rot she referred to was the big L. A local sidled up to me in my distraction. I nearly threw a soggy boot at the poor man out of fright. Hear about them fish stories then? He asked. He was covered in grey stubble and sported a fine pipe. Without an inv in invitation, the lump of a man pulled up a chair and tamped down his tobacco. I nodded. The old man smiled. They're all true, you know, he said, smiling with teeth so jagged they all seemed to vie for the best spot in his mouth. Every word. I seen him myself, God's truth. Best thing to happen a chip rug in all me years. Saves on the fishing, you know, all them presents they bring us. The silence had returned. Everyone was listening. I glanced about and met their grinning stares. I understood. The old man was not senile. He was testing the outsider's gullibility. I told him that he was the undiscovered comedic superstar of his generation and went about my business of removing socks. The other drinkers laughed. Beware the storm, lad, said the old man solemnly returned to his original table. He was the only one with a stern expression. I fumed silently and resolved to put some food in my stomach. Remembering my smoking acquaintance's warning, I steered clear of the trout special. Good old fish and chips did wonders. While I leave the cuisine critique to my colleague, Miss Dumont, I will say that the paddle and all fish and chips revives the half drowned. The dish came with a complimentary red ribbon, which was explained as being traditional. Thereafter, I retired to my room and, oh dear loyal reader, was I in for a night. 
The storm was horrible. Luckily, this time I was indoors and on a bed. The springs groaned as I pulled my blankets about my head. The terror of thunder still had a hold over me. Rain splashed the narrow windows, and I blessed the threadbare blankets and the borrowed socks. The occasional illumination of the room cast strange shadows on the grubby walls. It was gloomy, yes, that was the word, gloomy with the sparkle of electricity, as if something was about to happen. If I was some Hollywood bombshell in a shower, I would fear for my life. I tried to recall the faces of the tap room earlier. No, none of them looked like Mr. Hitchcock. Besides, you would not find me in a shower any time soon. I've seen enough water for a lifetime. It was when I shifted my glass of water away from me on the bedside table that I heard it. Not the roll of thunder or the howl of the wind. No, no cliches at all. It was a slap, slap, squelch, squelch, sound coming down the hallway. It made my heart stop. I must have imagined it. No, there it is again. It's getting closer. It's coming here to my room. Lightning flashed. Thunder rattled the windows. Regular readers of my column, no, that I often take issue with gormless horror movie teens who, against all sense, common or otherwise, abandon relative safety to expect the source of some disturbance or ungodly sound. Well, those of you who write in to complain about my complaining will be happy to know that I let myself down. Like a gormless horror movie teen, I rose from my bed and approached the door. The more soft-hearted readers among you will be comforted by the fact that I kept my blanket at the ready should the need for self-defense arise. The sound grew louder. Slap, slap, squelch, squelch. I cracked the door open a half an inch. I took care to keep the handle down to prevent it from squealing. It took me several seconds to find the courage to peek. There was something in the hallway, a dark figure outlined by the, in the occasional flash from the window behind it. It seemed to be limping towards me, dripping as it went. Dripping. This instantly roused my sympathies. This must be another poor soul who made use of Mr. Forshon's ferry service. The half-drowned sod moaned as he walked. I was resolved to cast off my blanket and rush to his side with a warm handshake. Let the poor chap know he's among civilized folk, despite the bleak evidence of the country. Lightning flashed again. One of the man's eyes caught the light. I slammed the door shut, leaned against it, and tried to catch my breath. Now this is where things get hard to explain, dear reader. I am sure of what I saw, but I am also sure that it is impossible. I was tired and probably coming down with some form of pneumonia or lepr leprosy, jury still out, and there was all that talk about fishmen and rural folklore. It could only have been an hallucination. I made sure that the door was properly closed, there was no key, and I returned to the bed with blankets covering even my face. I was a sick man, you see. I told myself that I needed sleep. All would be better in the morning. That was when the hallucination knocked on the door. Gathering all my courage, I told it to go away. There was another knock. The hallucination spoke. It was not a human voice. Not exactly. It clicked and bubbled through a throat not accustomed to air. Mon, monsieur be aboard? It gurgled. 
I am here too. Lightning flashed. The roll of thunder almost drowned out the squeak of the door handle. My shattered mind had a lucid thought. Run. I grabbed my blanket and the soggy remains of my jacket and pushed past the slimy figure just as it entered. Webbed fingers closed at me. I screamed, but I never looked back. It would have made it too real. The creature... Uh, um, the creature burbled at me as I ran down the hall. Across the pond, monsieur, I to take you. I arrived in the tap room more by falling down the stairs than descending them. Luckily, there was no one around to, to be subjected to my foul language. The boards above creaked. The creature was in, the, in pursuit. Evidently, I'd forgotten my pants and my notebook. Without the latter, a journalist, journalist was practically naked. The chill, damp jacket would have to do. I escaped into the night and onto the rainy streets of Chiprock. It seemed like a sane plan at the time, dear reader, but surely the fever had taken me. I ran across the cobbled streets in my boxers. Soggy socks splashed through the puddles. I headed down Main Street and towards the pier. The occasional flash lit the slippery way. In my blind panic, I did not notice them at first. The streets were busy. Hunched fing figures were proceeding up and down the thoroughfare. Each flash glinted of flat eyes the size of dinner plates, gaping mouths, silvery scales. These creatures went about their business, untroubled by the literary critic having a mental breakdown. Some opened garden gates with webbed fingers and walked up to front doors. Others bore buckets of fish. I could have sworn in my fever haze that a few buckets had a bright red ribbon on them. It was a nightmare. At the moment, uh, at that moment, I was fearf faithfully sure of that. This is what happens when you are half drowned. You are subjected to uh, subject your uh, subconscious to genre fiction. I kept running. I needed to get off this damned island. Through the rain, I found the warehouse where I had my arrival smoke. The door was ajar, spilling warm orange lights onto the street. Sanctuary. I rushed in and startled the occupants. Here, amid the boxes and containers, were two figures. The first was my smoking companion, the woman with the severe ponytail, and the second was, well, it was hard to explain. It, I was certain at the time that the man, it was a man with a misshapen head, fish-like, absurdly large eyes, gills, a gaping mouth, a cigarette was dangling from the latter. Perhaps strangest of all was the fact that the creature was wearing a flat cap, dungarees, and rubber boots. The world became a blur. I remember hitting the muddy floor of the warehouse. And that's the end of the extract, and you'll have to find out how the story ends in the book. All right, so that was a preview of one of the six stories in the book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so hopefully you enjoyed that, and hopefully you'll get an idea of what the book is about, or the tone of the book at least. Um, each one has a different voice, because um, it's a different journalist writing it. Um, so, at the end of that, does anyone have any questions? Okay. I 
first realized that I wanted to be a writer when when I read a story and I felt I could do it better. Now, that doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does, and there's obvious cliches or twists and turns, and I felt I could do it, and I tried, and it was harder than I thought, but I kept doing it. So, yes, that's why. Who's my favorite reporter in the book? That's a difficult to answer because I like them all and I kind of want to explore them all. Um, I like the self-importance of Jacques Bourdes, the one I, I just read about, because uh, you can mess with them a lot. I like messing with my characters. Um, well, I, what was my inspiration to spark this story? Well, um, I saw a, th a review of a very snooty literary critic who was down on all things slightly sci-fi, you know, mixing of genres and things, and I thought, what if you trap someone like that in a story like that? What would happen? That's what I tried. What did I learn from writing these stories? Well, I learned how to be, how to finish the story quicker. Because before this, I wrote a really long novel, like 600 pages. It takes me forever to get to the end of the story. And with these, with any short story, you kind of have to make it compact and only give the important parts. So that's what I did here, and I felt like I got better at it the more stories I wrote. And yes, they are scrapped stories that didn't make it into the book. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Any tips for aspiring writers? Yes. Don't give up. Um, sometimes stories don't work, characters don't work, bits of prose and description just don't sound right. You'll have to throw them away. And sometimes you have to throw away the stuff that sounds nice too, because as the story moves, it just doesn't fit. So. Don't worry about throwing stuff away, and don't stop. Those are my tips. Yeah. Okay, I'm getting some questions on WhatsApp. <laughs> okay. Thank you for watching, everybody. I'm glad you enjoyed the story. All right. So, I think I'm going to leave it there for now. If you're interested, I did post the link earlier in, in chat. I will post it again. Um, bear with me. All right, so 
these are the links to the book. Okay, so if you're in the US, and this one's for you in the UK. All right. So besides that, you can find me here. Sometimes I stream Dungeons and Dragons. As some of my Dungeons and Dragons people are here in the audience. Hello. And um, you can find me on my website, which is Calliope's Prisoner. I'll post the link. Um, and there I put any updates about my books. Um, you can find some free short stories there if you saw not convinced by my writing at all. Um, also, I, I, like I said, I review things, give writing tips, all sorts of things. And you can find me on the other links that are somewhere around the screen that I can't see. So, thanks everybody, thanks for watching, and thanks for your support. And I hope you're all interested to know the fate of Mr. Shackford and Shiprock and the other stories. Thank you, everybody.